Okay, uh, thank you all for joining. This is the fifth session on the on the seminars organized by UPM's Master in Quantum Computing. Today we have with us uh, Eric Kessler. He's from Amazon Web Services. Uh, he's a senior manager there and works uh, to bring quantum computing uh, technology to the AWS cloud. And over the past decades, he has been working in various industry roles across quantum computing and machine learning and has helped enterprise in their adoption of emerging technologies. Apart from that, he also has a PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics and has worked uh, several years as an academic researcher in quantum information uh, theory and computing. His talk today is going to be focused on how to perform a quantum computer research in the cloud with Thomas from Bracken. And it's great to have them uh, here. They helped uh, several times in the past uh, in, in the master. So it's great to have you here again, Eric. Thank you so much for accepting to deliver our talk. Uh, all yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the for the kind introduction. And um, thank you back to you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk here. Um, it's super exciting. It's a cool program. I'm very glad to be here. Um, as you said, I'm I'm a little bit of a boomerang into quantum computing, right? So I have uh, done my PhD in Munich uh, with Ignacio Sirac um, a, a while back, and then I had a postdoc with Michel Lukin in the US. And then I left the field to start working in machine learning, first at IBM, and then most recently at AWS, I was running our specialty practice for AI and ML on the East Coast. And then uh, I was, you know, at the right time, at the in, in the right place to um, join the AWS quantum computing effort, um, pretty much uh, on the ground floor as one of the first um, hires in that field, and have been lucky to um, help build um, what we're trying to do, which I think is pretty um, pretty exciting. Um, Right now, uh, I am the manager for the applied science team in Amazon Bracket. Um, and you may ask, uh, what is Amazon Bracket? And uh, I just have a quick screenshot here from our service. It's the uh, quantum computing service of AWS, right? So you can just um, uh, log into your AWS account or create an AWS account and, and start accessing quantum computers um, with you know no upfront commitment and on demand, just like you hit any other API on AWS. And we're gonna get a lot more into that. I just wanted to um, uh, set the stage for anybody who might not know what Amazon Bracket is. Um, but before we go deeper into the service and, and what we're doing, uh, let me quickly walk you through what I had planned for today. And you know, please everybody chime in and, and, and interrupt me if you have questions along the way. So I wanted to, to start giving um, a little bit of an introduction, kind of what is our view on the world? What uh, is the, um, you know, how, how do we think about quantum computing? How, how do we think about the technology? And how do we think about Amazon Bracket's place um, in the industry? And then I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the service, giving you an overview with a focus on the features and mechanisms that we have to support um, researchers um, like we have here on the call um, and how do we support academic research um, in, in, in general and try to develop features that allow researchers and scientists to access quantum computers over the cloud. And then we want to do a quick deep dive into one particular topic around analog Hamiltonian simulation. This is one of the paradigms, one of the devices that we have on um, Amazon Bracket that is quite different from usually what people think of when they hear the term quantum computers. Um, so we're going to dive a little bit into the physics and um, I'll, I'll show you some simple examples there. All right, um, so before we get there, um, I wanted to have a look at the question, you know, what are quantum computers useful for? Because usually when you get the question, what are the use cases for quantum computing, you always hear you know, optimization, quantum machine learning, uh, uh, chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the answer is more nuanced to it, right? When we look at this today, the, the predominant use case for quantum computers is entirely self-referential, right? So for example, many of our customers using the service today to learn about quantum computers, to uh, research quantum devices, understanding the noise sources of quantum devices better. On a tier above that, I think there is a use case where people are starting to try to use quantum computers to gain a better understanding of quantum algorithms. So you know there's uh, these variational algorithms, other heuristics that are really hard to understand with the pen and paper approach or also classical simulations that are eventually limited. So um, researching the convergence behavior, 
researching properties of quantum algorithms and helping closing that gap between the capabilities and the requirements uh, for actual use cases in industry um, is, is a main use case, right? And I think that um, today we're kind of still with prototype devices, but uh, we are um, on the cusp of, a, of an era where quantum computers are the most convenient tool to research um, uh, to, to, to research quantum algorithms. And that's very similar to the field of machine learning, by the way, where, you know, the, there was a lot of theoretical effort to try to understand how neural networks uh, function, for example, in the 60s and 70s, but the field really didn't take off until a broad community of researchers had access to hardware and data to um, develop these heuristics, develop these algorithms in a trial and error basis. Um, Okay, but you know, obviously, to, to, to these self-referential use cases that are dominating the industry today are not really why we're here for, right? So we all want to get, um, sorry, wrong direction. <laughs> we want to break out of that area of, of using quantum computers to study quantum computing, right? And um, ultimately, we want to get to that top tier of the layer, the promised land where we have broad industry applicability. And I think that's you know what what people are most excited about, obviously, and maybe people talk too much about it at this point. But I'd already be very excited about uh, going into a regime of a narrow quantum advantage where we don't even have a broad industry applicability, but we just have a particular type of Hamiltonian with a very very niche application area, maybe where a quantum computer is the most efficient tool to to study that Hamiltonian, right? That can be a very academic research, but I think the first milestone here is to get, you know, to, to use quantum computers um, as a tool, right? So we don't want to we, we don't want to continue studying the hammer. We actually want to use the hammer to drive a nail into a piece of wood, um, even if that's a very crooked and small nail. But we want to get out of that self-referential use case. And ultimately, you know, that, that is what we're here for, right? So Amazon Brackett's mission is that we want to enable customers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the term customers here because we have a very broad definition of this, but we want to enable customers to accelerate that path to useful quantum advantage, right? Um, we want to give them the tools uh, to, to, to move the industry uh, into that direction. And one of the predominant and one of the uh, key customer personas for us is in fact academia and academic researchers. Yeah, and again, so for us at AWS, that's very much in our DNA, right? We don't want to be the smartest people in the room. We want to build the tools so that the actual smartest people in the room, everybody here on the call, for example, can develop the um, you know can can do the best of their work, right? So in that sense. We really want to enable that flywheel between Amazon Bracket and researchers by providing hardware, providing tooling, providing easy access to this technology so that researchers in academia, but also in industry, of course, develop new algorithms, new noise mitigation strategies, new use cases, and feed that back into us. We're building better tools and thus we can drive the, the, the flywheel, right? And to achieve that, you know, we we have some key you know, key uh, roadmap um, themes that we're pursuing. Obviously, one of the key aspects is we give access to quantum computing technologies, a diverse range of quantum computing technologies on demand with no upfront commitment, right? So you don't need to make a subscription. You don't need to make individual contracts with different providers. You just need your credit card and um, an, an AWS account, and you can access these uh, different types of technologies. We're also continuing to give lower and lower level access to these devices. We're going to talk a little bit about pulse control that we recently launched. And we also, of course, develop software tooling that make it easy and, and powerful to control these devices. And then, of course, um, you know, for us, it was a very, very fundamental decision back in the day in 2019 when we started um, building uh, Amazon Bracket that quantum computing should not be this orthogonal thing to AWS. In a sense, we take the very conscious decision that Amazon Bracket is just another AWS service, right? It's just another a API that sits next to uh, classical compute, EC2, storage, S3, and, and whatnot, right? So and that also, um, of course, means that uh, you have at your fingertips all the other classical compute 
technologies of the AWS platform, high performance compute resources. So the full suite of computing tools that researchers need to, 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 to do their work. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about a program that we have um, that is called AWS Credits for Research. Um, so everybody um, uh, in academia, for example, can um, submit uh, uh, a request for um, credits, AWS credits, meaning that allows them to um, access uh, certain AWS services, including Amazon Bracket for free um, within a certain credit amount. Um, and all you need to do is to submit a, a short proposal and, and uh, that will be reviewed. And, um, and, and that is one mechanism by which we try to accelerate the research that is being done through Amazon Bracket. Um, yeah, so with that quick introduction, um, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the service and give those of you who haven't seen Amazon Bracket a little bit of, a, of, a, of an overview, what it is, what we have, um, how we're thinking about things. Um, and uh, after that, as I mentioned before, we're going to dive into one particular use case. So with Amazon, with Amazon Bracket, we think about these kind of four main components of the service, right? So we want to that that kind of follow the user journey um, uh, of, a, of a researcher, for example, or somebody else who's who's working on quantum computing today. Um, so we're thinking about build, test, run, and analyze, right? So in the build stage, we're providing um, programming tools. First and foremost, our bracket Python SDK. We have managed Jupyter environments, Jupyter notebooks, but of course you can also access everything through a command line interface. We provide a suite of different uh, circuit um, uh, simulators um, that customers can use to test and hyper, you know, and, and, and fine tune the algorithms that are running on demand on, on high performance infrastructure on AWS. And then, of course, uh, most importantly, we provide, provide access to multiple types uh, of quantum computers on demand in a secure fashion. And we also have features that allow you to combine classical resources with quantum computing resources to execute, for example, these hybrid variational algorithms in, uh, um, you know, uh, as fast as possible. And then, as I mentioned before, of course, we can lean into um, all the AWS ecosystem for monitoring, for analyzing, for data analysis and experiment management and so on and so forth. So um, let's dig a little bit deeper into each of these uh, buckets, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our software tooling um, that help you build uh, algorithms, build uh, programming tools. Um, so first and foremost, we have the bracket SDK or BDK as we usually call it. Um, think of it as a mechanism to on the one hand, interact with the service, interact with all of our devices, but also have a thin layer of building quantum computing algorithms and uh, interacting programming quantum computers, right? So we are generally seeing our role as uh, we want to expose quantum devices to their fullest capacity um, and provide the software tooling around that and then work with the community, work with others to build on top of that foundation, right? Um, so the Amazon Bracket SDK follows that principle. Um, you have uh, simple is a relatively lightweight um, uh, software library. You can pip install it. You have some simple uh, uh, local simulators that come for free and, and ship with it. And you have constructs that allow you to build quantum, uh, quantum circuits, you, uh, AHS program, analog Hamiltonian simulation programs, and so on and so forth. For higher level functionality, we're working with um, other open source libraries together. For example, we are on the um, steering council and working very closely with the Penny Lane team. I think we have another speaker from Xanadu later today, if I recall correctly. Um, and, and Penny Lane is really an awesome library for quantum machine learning and also uh, quantum chemistry that makes it super easy and intuitive. They're fantastic. Uh, 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 tutorials and educational material. And we're working super closely with the Penny Lane team to make sure that Penny Lane runs as a first party, uh, as a first class citizen on Amazon Bracket, making sure everything executes as efficiently as possible, integrating it with our uh, circuit simulators that allow you to go from kind of trying out things on your laptop to then scaling out your experiments into the cloud and on hardware, on quantum computers, et cetera. 
Similarly, we also integrated with uh, Qiskit. We have a Qiskit uh, bracket provider that allows you to run Qiskit code on Amazon bracket. So ultimately we're working towards a world um, where everything runs on bracket, right? We want to um, enable all the software tools that are built in the open source uh, to, to, to be compatible and to work um, with our service. Uh, of course, this is um, you know, not, not as easy as, say, in machine learning, where the abstraction between hardware and software is much more clean. Um, so there's uh, always a little bit of work, and we're always listening um, and are super curious to hear feedback in terms of what other software tools we need and should um, support. Um, within the bracket BDK, however, we are focusing a lot on the low-level control features um, that expose uh, low-level capabilities of quantum devices, um, specifically geared towards the researcher persona. So one example is uh, Amazon Bracket Pulse, right? So this is kind of the first software library, the first uh, time where uh, you can access more than you know, multiple different uh, superconducting devices through a Pulse interface. So you can do this today on Rigetti and OQC. This, you know, obviously very sp device specific, but with a common um, uh, programming interface, right? So that allows you to run uh, lowest level pulse programs uh, on, on these devices. And we're seeing a lot of customers using that specifically from the academic research community, but also a lot of startups building their business around, um, you know, accessing quantum computers at that analog level um, to fine tune, uh, fine tune, uh, you know, for example, gates or develop pulse level noise mitigation strategies and so on and so forth yeah so it allows you to um, take full control of the analog capabilities of the device and um, is this based on an uh, you know open specification we're working very closely with IBM on uh, the open chasm 3 specification we're also on the steering council there which we think is a very unique and and, and powerful uh, abstraction layer for defining what a quantum program is. And that is what our service is using as the specification language. Um, and yeah, we're seeing, as I mentioned before, researchers using this for better gate implementation, investigating QTRITs and uh, developing new error mitigation techniques, but also actually more and more um, interesting ideas around using that analog control on quantum devices to develop algorithms bypassing the gate level abstraction. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. So then very, uh, very briefly, um, <clears throat> let's talk about um, our simulators. Um, so we see the role of simulators um, really in that, uh, in, in that build, test, run journey, right? So quantum computers are still scarce resources. Unfortunately, we're not in a world where we can arbitrarily scale out the availability of quantum computers. So what we hear from a lot of customers is that they use simulators really to simulate and understand every um, parameter, every setting on a particular algorithm implementations before they um, then do kind of a hero run on an actual quantum computer, right? So it's, it's again, very similar to the case of, um, of machine learning, where you have a lot of free parameters or hyperparameters, as they say in that domain, that you, that you kind of need to tune in a trial and error basis. And we see that that is one of the predominant use cases for our simulators that customers are using today, where they try to understand what is the impact of the learning rate in a VQE or the different architectures of the ansatz and, and, and things like that, right? Um, so we provide a host of different simulators from <clears throat> local simulators that ship with our BDK. So they come for free. It's just think of it as the debugging tool. It just works, right? They're not trimmed for performance, but more so to, um, to just have an easy sanity check on, on your code and, and, and see what the, what the system is doing on low qubit numbers. Um, then we have our workhorse, workhorse simulator, SV1. It's a state vector simulator that goes up to 34 qubits. You can, um, you know, the, the, these, these simulators on the right here, they all work by just in your BDK, you have a single line of code to specify your circuit and then you do a, you know, you run it on that particular device and a bracket takes care of the rest, right? So we manage the infrastructure, we run the circuit on high performance 
uh, compute for you is just an API interaction. You send something and you get the result back. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and we also allow you to parallelize that out, right? So on SV1, you can run, for example, 100 uh, circuits in parallel, which can be very interesting for certain types of workloads and allow you to speed up testing and, and development quite significantly. Um, we also have a tensor network simulator that is more tailored towards uh, circuits with structure, um, to say a little bit vaguely, meaning those circuits that have kind of a low entanglement buildup have certain structure in either the connectivity or, or the depth or, or other characteristics and use this kind of tensor network simulation under the hood. And then we have a density matrix simulator for noise modeling, right? So in the BDK, you can define noise models, customize them or extract them, frankly, from the device through characterization routines, and then use a, the, the DM1, the density matrix simulator to simulate the impacts of noise on your, <clears throat> on your algorithms. Um, and then finally, uh, let's talk a little bit about our quantum computers, uh, the thing that probably most people are most interested about. Um, today we have a total of uh, five types of quantum computers on the service. Um, so we have three circuit or gate-based devices, um, which is uh, Rigetti, uh, a superconducting uh, device. We have an ion, uh, an, an ion trap device uh, from IonQ and another superconducting uh, device from uh, OQC, Oxford Quantum Circuits. All of these <coughs> are programmed using um, you know, the quantum circuit abstraction. Um, we have the device from QERA, which is an analog Hamiltonian simulator um, based on Rydberg atoms. We're gonna, this is the one that we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into, but this is the, the payload, so to say, is an analog program. Uh, we're gonna find what that means. Um, and then we have a photonic device from Xanadu. Um, so this is the Borealis device, which um, there's a the, 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 there is a paper that demonstrates, um, um, you know, a quantum supremacy experiment on this device. It's programmed as a photonic um, a continuous variable program, um, so everybody can, you know, uh, redo a quantum supremacy experiment in the cloud um, with a few uh, lines of code. So I have kind of these different <clears throat> payloads listed on the side, right? Quantum circuits, analog programs, photonic circuit. There are different ways to program them, but all of these programs are being sent with a construct that we call a task, right? So a task is an atomic unit of what a quantum computer can compute in a sense. Um, and, uh, so just in terms of terminology, and when you when 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 you run tasks on Amazon Bracket, this is essentially what happens, right? So users have different ways to accessing the service. So they we have kind of managed Jupyter notebooks, managed Jupyter environments that I mentioned. But of course, you can also download the Bracket BDK on your local laptop and access Amazon Bracket from there. Um, we also have a, a console experience um, where uh, when you go to 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 the AWS console. Um, that allows you to, to interact with a service in that way. But if you send a task to Amazon Bracket to our API, <clears throat> uh, we execute that on your behalf on a quantum computer that you choose, that you selected, or on one of the simulators. The simulator is obviously running on our, running in the AWS cloud. Um, the quantum computers today are being hosted in uh, the third party facilities of the companies that are producing them. You saw them on the previous slide. And just to reiterate that, right, Amazon Bracket is deeply integrated in AWS, right? So we provide monitoring, uh, which is based on uh, Amazon CloudWatch. You can uh, set notifications. You can store your results on S3. You can very fine-grained manage access and permissions uh, to, uh, to, to users in your account and, and data protection through uh, KMS. Um, and encryption, so just to name a few, right? So that list can, goes on and on that you can use to really um, customize your environment in that way. So that is what happens when you run an <clears throat> individual task. But as you all know, um, generally for, for, for advanced workloads, sending a single circuit doesn't cut it, right? So as an example, variational workloads, we know that we need to send batches of uh, of quantum of, of circuits uh, that are then being used to update some parameter on the classical part of the, your code and then send new parameters and another uh, batch of circuits and you know that can 
in in typical use cases you will need to send uh, thousands to tens of thousands of tasks that you need to execute um, this is true for these variational workloads but for many other workloads as well for example if you want to do a characterization run or or, or other scientific studies uh, in terms of <clears throat> using the device so and and, and generally that is pretty hard and there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong, right? So you need to, when you think at the example of these variational workloads, you need to set up and maintain that classical environment that needs to be running uh, and, and, uh, and needs to be there for the entire time that the quantum computers <coughs> take um, to execute this workload. You need to monitor convergence and you wanna see how you're actually progressing. Is your algorithm converging? Does it make progress on the training? Um, and of course, you know, we know these quantum computers today, um, they're not as stable as, as a classical computer, right? So there's device drift, the, the properties of the device, they slowly change. So once you start an algorithm, you want to make sure it converge, it, it executes as quickly as possible, right? And so all of these problems are the reason why we introduced um, uh, this this feature, which is called Amazon Bracket Hybrid Jobs, right? So instead of sending individual tasks or individual circuits, jobs allows you, hybrid jobs allows you to send the entire algorithm, right? So you, you, you give us an entire, uh, say, Python script or a Python module, can be multiple files that you send to, to Amazon Bracket, and Amazon Bracket will execute that on your behalf on a dedicated single tenant uh, classical compute instance that has priority access to the QPUs for as long as the algorithm runs, right? So you may need to wait a little bit until that workload kicks off. But once you have access to the device, you have priority and we make sure that it executes the fastest way possible um, so that uh, we minimize the effect of device drift. Yeah, and so <clears throat> following these 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 uh, uh, examples from before, uh, jobs allows you to do this research much more conveniently, right? It's kind of a, what we call fire and forget. You define your algorithms, you have tested it on simulators, and now you just send it up and, and Amazon Bracket makes sure to execute it when the device is available, when we have enough time to execute the algorithm and we execute it with, with priority. We provide insights into the execution of the algorithm so you can define custom metrics <coughs> that are being pumped out of your runtime into for example the amazon bracket console so whatever you want to uh, monitor whatever you want to track you can track and see in real time um, and uh, we already spoke at length about the priority access but we continue to improve the performance reduce service overhead uh, in optimize the throughput um, to, to make this as efficient as possible. And you see, um, <clears throat> this feature actually is very much inspired by the way that we are doing machine learning on AWS. So our machine learning service, Amazon SageMaker, has a feature that uh, SageMaker training that is very, very similar. And we con consciously followed uh, the user experience and the learnings from the machine learning uh, community there, right? Because when you look at these variational algorithms, you know, there's an uncanny uh, parallel uh, uh, here in terms of what happens when training these algorithms. And I do firmly believe that the quantum computing uh, community can learn a lot <clears throat> from the journey, the long journey that the, the machine learning community has, has, has done over the past decades, right? And it's a kind of a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, where I think that there's a lot we can learn in quantum computing from the from the existing learnings on the machine learning side, right? So when you think about machine learning, it was also very uh, a field very heavily dominated by 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 kind of theoretical analysis in the 60s and 70s, and that changed, right? It, the the whole academic field also underwent a uh, a, a change into an experimentation mindset uh, where it's. Um, very much focused on on figuring, you know, trial and error, build and test heuristic approaches, and iterate towards what works and what doesn't work. Um, and frankly, it ran away a little bit from the theory. And the theory is catching up now, but um, it's still an interesting, uh, an interesting um, uh, approach. I think <clears throat> the whole point about uh, adoption-led innovation I was always found fascinating in machine learning because, as I mentioned before, right, the machine, the field of machine learning 
really took off once data and infrastructure and tooling became ubiquitous and, and a broad array of a broad community of researchers and users were able to access these things, you know, not the least via the cloud. Um, so the cloud played a big role in the adoption of machine learning around the world. And, you know, we obviously hope that we'll follow that path on the quantum computing side. And then what I mentioned before, right, I think in terms of the tooling, we can learn a lot um, in, in, in how, do we, how do we do rigorous experimentation management? How do we make it easy to train and um, monitor and uh, organize these algorithms? And we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, templates to follow. We have interesting blog posts around how do you use the experiment management, for example, around uh, uh, Amazon SageMaker and build, use these tools that have been developed in machine learning and apply them to quantum computing to do rigorous experimentation management and, and, and model governance in a sense. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so yeah, um, you, you can follow our blog channel. We have a little bit of a theme where we talk about these analogies and, and, and the toolings that you can utilize uh, out of machine learning for quantum computing. And then uh, last but not least, I wanted to <clears throat> show a little bit um, uh, this, um, this, this, this program we have that is tailored for, for research. Uh, it's called Cloud Credit for Research. I'll give you all a link later um, in uh, the last slide that I have. But uh, just to, to tease it here, um, so this is a program by which you can um, request research credits um, to offset your costs on Amazon Bracket. Um, all you need to do is submit a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a short abstract and a rough estimate of the cost. Um, and then somebody from our team will be in touch to, um, to, 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 to go over that with you. And, and, and in many cases that, that request is granted. So keep that in mind if you have a great idea uh, how to push forward research and and do something interested with the interesting with the devices that we have um on amazon bracket all right um so uh with that let me take a sip of water <clears throat> so with that um we uh wanted to go a little bit deeper into one particular area, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of different compute technologies that we have available, uh, as we mentioned before on Bracket, um, and we unfortunately can't cover everything. But so I thought, let's focus on <clears throat> one particular device that we recently launched end of last year um, that, that is really geared towards, um, you know, um, scientific and academic use cases um, and, and has an interesting twist, in my opinion. So this is <clears throat> the uh, Rydberg Atom device from QERA Computing um, focused as a special purpose device on analog simulation. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. Right? So coming back to my introduction here, right? So the big question that we all are interested in, how do we get from where we are today to this area where we all want to be, right? How do we break out out of these self-referential use cases and start using quantum computers as a tool? So, you know, what are the most promising use cases to achieve that? Well, <clears throat> we can we can go back to, to uh, Feynman here, right? And I'm sure you all have seen this uh, quote um, and I removed the expletives <laughs> uh, just to be safe, but he said, you know, nature is cl isn't classical. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, <clears throat> you better make it quantum mechanical, right? So I think <clears throat> for me personally, I think when we look at the, the use cases, um, it is, it is you have this huge advantage with these, uh, you know, um, simulation use cases where already the encoding overhead in a classical description is exponential, right? When you look in contrast to optimization and, and quantum machine learning, for example, that isn't clear, right? To, 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 to solve um, you know, a complex uh, quantum mechanical system, even writing down the state is not possible on a, quantum, on a, on a classical computer, uh, much less so the, the actual computation. That is in contrast to these kind of Krova-like uh, applications, right? In optimization where, <coughs> 
you very much can write down the classical problem and then it's still NP hard, but uh, you lose that initial uh, encoding overhead. So, um, <clears throat> you know, simulating sim simple uh, quantum mechanical systems is, you know, the most promising application um, that, that we can think of today, right? So <clears throat> now let's let's take an example of that, right? So let's say we want to simulate some simple spin model, right? Some Heisenberg model um, like here, uh, and we want to understand what's the observable at the end of that evolution. And maybe that spin model sits on some kind of graph with different connectivities. So there are essentially two ways how we could go about this, right? So the first one, <clears throat> following the gate-based quantum computing model, well, we can transform this analog model. We transform it and cubitize it, we trotterize it, then we translate it and compile it onto the particular QPU that we have. We get a circuit that is nativized onto the device, then we translate that into a pulse schedule, and ultimately we run that again on a quantum computer, which also is an analog device, right? So we're going from an analog problem, digitize it, translate it and going back into an analog device yeah and <clears throat> you know that's 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 a promising path huh? I think uh when when we look at the simplest possible um uh, uh you know models like the Heisenberg model um the best estimates if we use all the tricks in our pocket in terms of error mitigation and so on and so forth and and having like 24 hour dedicated time on a QPU the best estimate is still we would need two orders of magnitude over the current state of the art um, uh, fidelities on the device, right? So there's still a long way to go. I think it's very promising. And I think it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> a, 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 a lot of progress that we need, um, but obviously the gate level abstraction is very useful to, to reason about these things, to think about error mitigation, to think about error correction. It's a useful abstraction um, and a powerful abstraction in the future. But in the, in the short term, you can gain something by bypassing this abstraction and say, why don't we immediately or directly simulate this model that we're interested in, in a analog fashion and bypassing the gate level abstraction, saving those multiple orders of magnitude overhead that we would be required in the gate-based model. Right? And that's exactly the idea of analog Hamiltonian simulation, right? So you have <clears throat> a quantum system, say our Heisenberg model, that we want to study, and it evolves under some kind of uh, 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 propagator U. And now let's find a mapping into a device uh, where we can control this evolution. And we prepare it, we let our device evolve, and then we just look at the device. And if we make sure that the device represents these dynamics accurately, we can um, we can just observe it, right? We engineer another quantum system that makes sure it represents the dynamics that we're interested in. We let it evolve and then measure. And you might ask, so why don't we observe the quantum system directly? Like, why do we even need that device? And the answer is quite simple, right? Because we want to be able to have a target system that is tunable and observable, right? We don't know this quantum system might not be observable in the first place. We may not be able to, you know, um, tune the parameters in the same way. So it gives you a control test bed to study a certain type of Hamiltonian. And last end of last year, we launched a device um, from QERA. Um, so that is a, a spin-off uh, from Misha Lukins uh, and uh, Vladan Vulitic and, um, and, and others from uh, Markus Kreina from, from Harvard and MIT. Um, it's a startup building Rydberg um, uh, atom devices that follow exactly that paradigm of analog Hamiltonian simulation. So you see here the vacuum chamber of the device um, where individual uh, Rydberg atoms are suspended in air. Um, there are, uh, uh, you know, today 256 atoms that you can freely arrange in space and, 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 and control. I'm going to go through that a little bit. But first, you know, in the lab, it's really a new generation of experiments, right? So in, in, the, in the Harvard lab, there have been a number of papers in nature and, 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 and science that show how you can use this tunable analog simulator to really dem demonstrate 
simulations of quantum dynamics, starting with this paper from 2017, um, scaling it up to 256 atoms and studying quantum phase transitions, studying and observing for the first time topological spin liquids, but also using it for optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of interesting scientific results, some novel, um, you know, experimental realizations like this effect of quantum scars that uh, wasn't really understood, has been observed in the device and then only afterwards uh, realized uh, the, the theoretical explanation for it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting direction to use these devices in, 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 this, in this fashion. So let's dive a little bit into the, the physics of the device. <clears throat> so at the core of these Rydberg devices is the capability to trap and arrange large arrays, 2D arrays of um, individual um, uh, rubidium atoms in this case. Yeah? So what happens is you load um, from the uh, magneto-optical trap, you have an atomic cloud, that is being loaded here. You have a spatial light modulator that allows you to create this kind of pattern. Um, and you have a 2D acousto-optical deflector that allows you to pick up, transfer, and release individual atoms. So when you start trapping them, you kind of get this um, uh, um, random arrangement. Sometimes you are lucky you catch one atom, sometimes you don't but then you use the uh, acousto-optical deflector to pick up atoms and rearrange them. So you can go from this um, stochastically filled lattice to a deterministically filled arrangement <coughs> with today up to 256 atoms on Amazon bracket. Yeah? Um, so you have the ability to arrange these atoms in in customizable lattices. We're showing square lattice here, but there's really quite some freedom uh, how you can uh, create and, and what patterns you can create um, uh, within some constraints. You are pretty much um, able to, to, to freely move them around before your actually experiment. Well, so yeah, so we, we, we are able to, to trap and arrange these atoms. So now we need to do something interesting with them and doing something interesting with them always means have the things interact in a quantum mechanical way, right? So then let's make step, make, let's make a step back and, and talk about what are Rydberg atoms, right? <clears throat> so generally, a Rydberg atom can be any atom that has a very highly excited um, atomic state, right? So where the outer shell electron goes into a highly excited orbit. Um, so it's a little bit of a vague definition, but typically people refer to Rydberg atoms to the alkaline and alkaline earth elements here. First and foremost, the uh, alkaline elements, um, for example, uh, rubidium, because there you have, of course, the inner shell electrons shielding the, the nuclear core, and you can almost treat it like a hydrogen atom in a sense, right? And, you know, what makes it a Rydberg atom is that when you shine laser light on it, you can excite that outer shell electron into a very high principal quantum number, into a very high orbit and does make it very big. And when I say very big, I really mean it, right? So this is, you know, in the, in the ground state, obviously an, an atom, right? It's atomic size, like nanometers, so 0 0.5 nano, nanometers or something. But when you excite it into this, uh, say, uh, principal quantum number of 70, this thing becomes, you know, several micrometers large, right? And <laughs> that's huge. And uh, I was looking before this talk for a good analogy and, um, uh, I, somebody needs to 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 fact check me on this, but I just googled and I found one of the objects that I found surprising uh, that is of the size of a few micrometers is actually the diameter of the hair of a chinchilla. So you all know these little uh, South American animals that have this very soft fur, and the fur is so soft because the hair is so thin. So I I, I saw some in, in a paper that the diameter of this. Uh, chinchilla here is a few, you know, maybe tens of micron, microns. Um, so maybe somebody has to fact check that, but I just found uh, this a, a, a incredible comparison to how big these red book atoms are actually are. And, and most importantly, when you think back of the um, arrangement that we had here, so micrometers is exactly the kind of distance of these lattices that we can arrange is actually much larger than the distance, the minimal distance of these lattices where we can arrange them. 
So that means, <clears throat> you know, we have two atoms sitting next to each other. If we can, and both excite them in the Rydberg state, they're feeling each other, they're feeling an interaction. As, as a matter of fact, this van der Waals interaction scales with the inverse of the distance to the power of six. So that's why people talk about this blockade radius, Rydberg blockade radius, where once you're within you, this one over six, one over r to the six dependency is almost like a wall that, uh, that, that the interaction runs into, where if two atoms are within the blockade radius, they cannot be excited at the same time, right? So if the, one of the atoms is already in the excited state, the other electron cannot go up there. And uh, you have this kind of selective addressing, it's an interaction. This is how you establish long range interactions with this coherent Rydberg blockade. And depending on how far these atoms are apart from each other, you can have interactions that span multiple nearest neighbor sites um, in, in, in one of these lattices. So um, what does that mean? Um, so yeah, okay, so we talked about that. So sorry, maybe I should make this more explicit, right? So if, if the atom two here moves a little bit closer, it essentially pushes up that, that excited state in energy and you cannot excite it anymore with a fixed laser frequency. So putting that together, <clears throat> this is kind of the prototypical Hamiltonian that you can realize in an Rydberg system, right? So you have the individual atoms, you can drive them with a laser, you can excite them. So this is the drive Hamiltonian, right? So we can pick, pick a certain detuning, we can pick a certain amplitude of the drive laser, we can pick a phase. Um, but then we have this interaction term that depends on the atom locations and the distance between the atom location that establishes this interaction, right? So we have a tunable Hamiltonian that <clears throat> has some uh, drive parts, some excitation parts, and we have a um, ZZ interaction effectively that depends on the location of the atoms, which is also tunable, right? We can move the, in, the atoms in and out of interaction um, and, and, and define exactly what we want to do. So what have people done with this in the lab, for example? Well, you know, just a very simple, one of the first papers around it was the study around different quantum phases of matter, um, which is relatively a uh, simple idea. And then studying the, the quantum phase transition properties at different points. <clears throat> what you do here, essentially you, you, you ramp the drive, but then you change, you, you, you slowly ramp the detuning over the resonance and depending, <clears throat> depending on the lattice site that you have chosen, whether how many atoms are within the blockade radius, you realize different types of, of phases. And you can study that transition going from one phase to the other, right? So where you have the checkerboard phase where essentially you're sitting, you know, um, exactly within one blockade radius. So each neighbor blocks out one of the one of the neighboring atoms. We can go to a striated phase or to a star phase, depending on the different um, uh, distances and study the properties of these of these different phases, right? Um, <clears throat> so just to close the loop here, um, you can do this exact experiment in the cloud today with a few lines of code, right? Um, so this is the bracket BDK um, that we that we spoke about that allows you to program uh, this quantum computer with a few lines of code. You can arrange the atoms in a in a particular uh, 2D arrangement. So as here's an example, we just line them up, um, just a few of them. As I mentioned before, we can have up to 256 on the QR device in on bracket today. You define the pulse schedule. So here we're doing exactly what you saw in the nature paper before, right? So we have a constant drive um, and then we ramp up the detuning. We do that with a couple of lines here. Well, and then we just need to assemble this program. Um, so we give it the register that we put together, the atom arrangement and the Hamiltonian. And then we can either test it on a simulator for free. <clears throat> so we set up our local simulator and then just do a dot run with the program. Or if we wanna run it on the actual QERA device, all we need to do is change this line of code, change our device to the actual quantum computer. 
and then just run it and get the results back. So um, I just wanted to show that how simple it is to get started um, and how, how, how quickly you can reproduce some of the, some of the results. And obviously that is, um, you know, was one of the first experiments that was done on, on these types of devices. And there are many more uh, research proposals and ideas that are being pursued um, by, by our customers at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, I'm super, super curious to learn um, um, what others are coming up with. I, I should also mention, <clears throat> We have a lot of uh, interesting other tutorials um, available for you. Um, so if you want to go to uh, our GitHub uh, page with Amazon bracket examples, you can uh, find a lot of tutorials around QRA, around Ritberg computing, but also all the other devices. Um, you know, uh, if you haven't already, uh, you can always sign up for an AWS uh, account um, and get started today with bracket. Uh, it's really simple. To, to run your first uh, simulation on a notebook uh, or on a managed simulator, where we have also some uh, free, <coughs> free tier. So the first hour per month on our managed simulators is always free. Um, <clears throat> here's the link that I promised about the AWS credits for research, where you can apply for um, uh, you know, credits to execute a particular experiment, a particular research. And of course, um, you know, we always love to hear from you. Uh, if you have used Bracket um, and you have feedback on it, or you um, done something that helped your research, we always love to hear uh, from you. So don't hesitate to 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 reach out. And um, yeah, with that, I think I'm almost at an hour. So um, thank you very much for 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 listening in, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been a great talk. Um, I don't know if there are any questions in, in the audience for Eric. In the meantime, oh, yeah, we, we actually have one. Adrian, would you like to just jump in and, and use the, the microphone or would you like me to read the, the question instead? Anything works. Yes, hello. Uh, it's a great talk. Just I would like to know if it is possible to use uh, TensorFlow Quantum and here. With us because you talk about Qiskit, but I don't know with TensorFlow Quantum. So you can use TensorFlow with Penny Lane on bracket out of the box. Um, yes, <clears> yes <throat> but not Quantum. It's... Yes, <laughs> we don't have a native integration with TensorFlow Quantum yet. I think there's actually um, an open source integration with Circuit Bracket, <clears throat> but I have to double check. Um, we don't have anything first party, so to say. So we haven't built an integration with Circ directly. And as far as I know, TensorFlow Quantum has used a circ as the backend. Okay, thank you. I had one in the in the meantime. So you were mentioning the research credits and so on. So I don't know if you could give us a, a few examples of projects that are already taking place. Mm -hmm. And it, also for, for the people here, they are going to, to do their master thesis in the upcoming weeks and months. If there's any chance of uh, uh, sending some of those ideas over to our Amazon Web Services, maybe it could make sense to develop something. Yeah, um, so the first one, uh, examples. Um, so we had just, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to send over a couple of the papers that were done uh, with Amazon Bracket. Uh, they were, um, you know, a, a recent benchmarking study that was done out of Caltech. Um, we had uh, researchers with uh, uh, from, from Singapore, um, looking into uh, a version of um, Adapt VQE, if I remember correctly. So there are a um, bunch of examples that I'm, I'm happy to share offline. Um, <clears throat> in terms of in terms of uh, credits for the master program, um, to be maximally honest, I don't know. Um, so maybe let's take that offline. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we can we can figure something out. Um, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, if 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 folks are interested. Um, um, Let's 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 follow up you and I and and we can we can uh, talk about how that could look like. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I see another one on the on the chat. So uh, Abdelal is saying which kind of application we can use the quantum computer for? Uh, could it be used for sophisticated calculations? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, sophisticated calculations is a, 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 obviously a, a broad term. <laughs> so I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, as, as I said before, right, I think it is extremely important to, um, to, to, to look at this technology and talk about this technology with a humble and a realistic view. Yeah. Um, certainly quantum computers are not there yet to change industries and, and disrupt industries. Um, I think we're just at the cusp to seeing very narrow applications, like I talked about, right? Somebody wanting to study spin liquids in spin models, right? So that's a very niche application. It's maybe five to 10 people in the world are interested in that, but it's still meaningful, uh, a meaningful application in, 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 in my eyes, right? And um, <clears throat> the challenge for the field will be to, you know, establish these first use cases where quantum computers are being used as a tool in academia or frankly in uh, a number of, uh, you know, maybe a small handful, a number of uh, uh, enterprise customers, big companies are also studying very fundamental quantum physics uh, phenomena, right? I mean, I know of a, um, a materials company in Germany that has a team working on the Hubbard model, right? So, I mean, you know, the, the, the chasm between, it's, it's not black and white, I guess, right? So some of the, apologies, some of the, some of the enterprise customers are doing very fundamental research um, and, and are operating on very long time scales. And when we say a sophisticated calculation, when we say a useful advantage for quantum computing, we don't always have to talk about the billion dollar market that, you know, will change and disrupt entire industries. I think it will be much more gradual and, um, and, and we will see quantum computers creep, creep into, you know, very niche applications first and then grow from there. Thank you. I don't know if we have any other questions from anyone. Thank you, Perminder. Excuse me, just I would like to know how we can apply for the credit. Um, so here is the link. Um, I, I think we're sharing the slides out, Rafael. Is that true? Um yeah, so, we, can, we, can, we can do that. Um, but I'm 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 also happy to to send the link. If you go to um, you know, this web link or to, to Amazon bracket, there is actually at the top a small tab that um, I think it's getting started and then you can see bracket for research or something like that. And from there, there's the process laid out and explained. Um, I think we have Perminda on the call. If, if you get stuck, um, uh, he can always help um, shepherd this along or, or, or give you the support. And also, of course, reach out to me uh, if, if, if you want. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And the, the code for bracket, I, I think it's open source, right? So anyone can actually contribute to that and, and offer any... Yes, we love open source contributions. Um, all of our software assets, um, our uh, programming tools are open source. Um, uh, we, we have a community of contributors to it. Um, you can, as I mentioned before, the bracket BDK, the bracket SDK, you can download it on your laptop and just use the local simulator and never connect to bracket if you if you want to just uh, play around and get started. Um, uh, and, and then also it makes it easy to connect to the cloud and, and run on actual quantum computers from there. But yeah, everything's open source and, and um, we love to love to see people contribute. We also um, recently uh, joined the Unitary Fund as a member. So we're gonna have some bounties soon uh, around <laughs> Um, you know, supporting that uh, ecosystem. Um, we are, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, very closely uh, working with Penny Lane that has a big open source community. He is also maybe the right time to plug QHack. If you haven't registered for QHack, it's a great event. Um, you can win a lot of exciting prizes from AWS uh, up to $10,000 in AWS bracket credits. Um, our team will be there um, in the Slack channels and, and on site and um, supporting and, and helping people get started with Bracket and getting the most out of the devices. So that's uh, there's always a highlight for us and, and obviously also a big open source community. That's amazing. In fact, we have Perminder, he's uh, mentioning that the Qiskit integration with Amazon Web Services is often also um, developed by Amazon Web Services itself. So they often 
uh, you often send uh, push request uh, pull requests and, and everything to to the repos as well. So that's that's great. Yeah. So actually, so the the, the Qiskit plugin <clears throat> that started as a pure open source project um, from uh, some Qiskit enthusiasts, and um, you know we we thought it was interesting. Some engineers from our team. Uh, uh, took that on as a challenge to 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 work with the open source community and and um, help you know structure it in the in the right way and 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 contribute to it. Um, so that's a really great example of where uh, the open source um, um, you know uh, process was very was very successful. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions. Okay, uh, I think that should be more or less everything. In any case, if any of you want to reach out to, to Eric or the team afterwards, we can always put you in touch with them. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, again, for, for your time and, and your experience. It's, it's been an amazing talk. So happy to have you here again. And yeah, I hope we can keep working in the, in the future. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. No, it was awesome being here. And um, I hope everybody enjoys the other cool talks that are that are on the agenda. Um, I'm going to listen in myself. Thank you. Okay. We're going to have a break of 25 minutes, more or less, and then we'll continue with the, with the next one. Thank you, everyone.